Hello students, and welcome to my final YouTube recording for the fall semester here, 2019 at Tazem. Uh, this is to help you prepare for your exam. It's on evolution. Note that we did not get all the way through unit three on evolution. We knew uh, that wouldn't happen. We'll come back to it when we get back from winter break. I hope you've enjoyed it so far and seen some illustrative examples in class. Just like all my videos, this is not for profit. It's just meant to help you and others likewise can use it, but they cannot use it for money. All right, so uh, I don't do this very often, but I had some notes on the board for you uh, to try and guide you through how I like to approach evolution, which is in a series of six questions. So what is it? We've all heard the term, but what is it? What does it mean to be the theory of evolution by natural selection, which is different in science than it is in, say, the theory of who you're going to hang out with at the high school dance? Uh, what causes evolution? We went over to five fingers of that. And we said, well, if this is a theory. There has to be tons and tons of evidence. And so we went over what evidence exists for evolution. So if evolution's happening, if this change is happening, what changes occur in a population due to it? We took a little bit of time talking about how evolution happens in a population, not on an individual level. And so we also then dove back into you know, the start of time and said, well, where did life come from? How does evolution explain both the unity of life on Earth and the beautiful diversity of life on Earth? This question to me is just astounding in its beauty and its grandeur. We went over to Charles Darwin quote, and I played you some Attenborough stuff, and hopefully you enjoyed it. When we come back from winter break, we'll get into speciation, really phylogenetics and how uh, species become separate. And then from there, we'll jump into our upcoming units on heredity, which I think you'll really enjoy with genetics and DNA, et cetera. All right, so the first question, what is, it, what is evolution? Can you provide an example of it? Go ahead and stop the video and see what you can get. Okay, we started this with uh, our phenomena, where we we're going to make that driving question board. And the question we asked is, what happened to this poor young lady, Addie, who got so sick? She got uh, community-associated MRSA. And so we say, well, how does that happen? How do bacteria evolve to beat antibiotics? And so to do that, we wanted to start with a model. And we built that model by using HHMI's rock pocket mice. And so this is in the south. Uh, Western United States, and here is the beautiful mouse, and we said it was the Snickers bar of the desert, right? That birds can fly in and find them and eat them, snakes, etc. as well. And so if there's variation in the population, it can be white or dark. <clears throat> you see that mutations happen randomly. This one's dark. It will be selected against in this type of environment, and it's less likely to live and pass on its genes. The environment changes, the lava flow happened. Well, now all of a sudden this uh, dark mouse is going to be selected for. This dark mouse is going to have an advantage in differential uh, reproductive success. It'll be more likely to reproduce. And you can see the spread of the dark genes over time. Um, the best part I think of this video was, uh, and we paused it, we talked about it when Sean Curl said that, you know, mutation is random, but natural selection is not. So mutation, sex, et cetera, shuffling of genes provides the material for evolution, but then the environment selects the winners or losers. And Mr. Anderson in his, his Five Fingers video did the same thing with the thumbs up or the thumbs down. So I thought that was important when we did this uh, activity with the sorting them out on the cards we saw that, you know, there are dark mice that do pop up even when it's just light sand, right? And so as the environment's constantly changing and, or, and populations are constantly evolving as different pressures act on them. <clears throat> Here it is written out, and this is from Khan Academy. So uh, population of mice moved into a new area. Rocks are very dark. So due to natural genetic variations, some mice are black while others are tan. And so that's showing you like it has to have something that can be passed on. It has to have um, a genetic component to it. I know we haven't done genetics yet, so this might be tough for you, but many of you have had our primer on that in middle school. All right, the mice reproduce. There's gonna be more mice than uh, can survive. There's gonna be uh, pressures on them from predators as well. And so the mice that have those traits that lead to the highest 
fitness, the greatest chance of surviving and reproducing are the ones that live and pass on those genes. So you can see that what is evolution? We said change over time. We could say change in a population over time. We can also say change in the gene pool over time because genes are what lead to these. So I thought this was pretty cool. If we see that it's just a 1% advantage to be dark, it'll still really pass through the population in a thousand years. And you can see I took this right from the video that we watched. And then if it gets 10% advantage, it really gets compound. So that was that one. <clears throat> I showed you that from this, uh, you know, we went over a little bit with Darwin. Um, we watched just a little bit of the movie about Darwin and Alfred Wallace and uh, coming up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. And this famous uh, drawing of his right here, that he's showing that over time species can change. And so uh, here is showing the first phylogenetic tree and showing the, the evolution of different species. And so we talked a little bit about that in terms of the finches on the Galapagos Island. And so from one finch or one species of finch emerged other species on different islands as they adapted to their environments. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So let's go over the theory of evolution by natural selection. Um, there's going to be every species tends to produce more individuals than can survive to maturity. There's some type of variation within them. The traits that help them have the highest fitness in that environment are the ones that are selected for. And that adaptation then persists in the environment. So an adaptation is a trait. It could be behavioral or physical that gives an organism greater fitness. So here it looks like it's more fit to be dark, all right? But what if the environment changed? It might be more fit to become, to be lighter. And so they could change, they could evolve back, right? Evolution is not goal oriented. It simply keeps progressing to select for those traits that are best suited to the environment at that time. All right, so ultimately we said it can be a change in the gene pool. These are reflected in phenotypes. What a phenotype means, students, is a physical trait. Here would be an example, um, genetic-wise, uh, and this is just kind of goes off of Mr. Anderson's video with the, the cards and the red-headed people and not. So here would be brown rabbits, and here would be white rabbits. There's going to be some type of selection. It looks like it's bad to be a white bunny rabbit. You don't want to get eaten. Oh, no. So over the next generation, the dark bunny rabbits reproduce more. They're more likely to reproduce. Look at that, the percentage of genes that code for the uh, brown rabbits went from 50% to 65%. Um, these numbers you don't have to worry about. You can take AP biology with me and you can really compute them. It's called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But for us, you can just see that it's a change in the gene pool over time. All right, so hopefully that helped you construct an explanation of what is evolution. Um, we did a pogo on it, and the pogo was really important because it helped us construct an explanation for why Addy got so sick. We looked at bacteria and we said, well, bacteria can have mutations. They can uh, pick up foreign DNA. They can pass genes in between each other, right? Instead of just uh, horizontal gene transfer, instead of just vertical gene transfer. So they have a lot of ways to increase their diversity. And then if we're Having antibiotics, we're selecting against those that are susceptible to the antibiotics, and we're selecting for the bacteria that can beat the antibiotics. And then we got into a little bit of the ethics of the antibiotic industry, which was really interesting, right? Like uh, drug companies don't uh, want to, or they, don't, they tend to put their research dollars into things other than antibiotics. It's because the bacteria evolve so quickly to beat them. They can make more money off of a cholesterol drug or a heart medication, et cetera. So we got into a little bit of ethics there. Um, I wish we had had more time on it, but it's uh, the way it goes. If you like to discuss those ethical debates and principles, uh, I encourage you to take scientific issues with me, which uh, you can take as a junior or senior here at Taze. Okay, in the interest of time, we got to move on. So the five fingers, see if you can pause the video and remember the five fingers. And it's not just about memorizing the forces of evolution. Can you give an example of each and how uh, they might have played out in evolution? All right, hopefully you got the thumb is natural selection. 
right? Uh, thumbs up for adaptations that help, thumbs down for ones that don't. Uh, the pointer finger can be for gene flow, for immigration and immigration from a population. The middle finger, don't want to do it on its own, but that could be for mutations. The ring finger can be for sexual selection or choosing mates. And the pinky finger can be a, for a population bottleneck or for a shrinking population size. They may be susceptible to genetic drift. So let's see some examples of them in action. All right. Here is gene flow. This is an example of humans migrating. So they would be going around. Um, mutation, the flu virus, why we need a new flu shot every year. So it's constantly mutating. Sexual selection here, you got peacocks are probably the best example or mating dances by flies. And then here is the bottleneck. So this one was a little tricky for students. I showed a soda bottle in class. I, all I have right now is a Coke soda can. But if it had a small top, right? And then the population got cut down by an asteroid or a really bad event, maybe by chance, these genes are present in the, uh, the population that's left over and only a few of these genes. And so the final population may be a different color than the first one, right? Because it just by chance had less genetic diversity. Um, we went over a couple of examples of that. So here's a good one, right? So here's all these different genes. You can think about them. And then if this is the group that goes and forms a new population, either this one gets wiped out from a disaster or this group, say, moves and just them go along, you're going to have a lot more of these orange dots. <clears throat> a good example of this would be uh, the Amish and Ellis Van Crevel syndrome, or having multiple, uh, more than uh, four fingers right there. I ended up having six. Okay, I'm going to pause the video for a second. Okay, back. So uh, let's go over the evidence that exists for evolution. And for this, uh, we did another poll goal. And there are readings and ed puzzles that you should go back and check out. And so we talked, as before we started the lesson, we talked about what does a theory mean in science. And a theory in science is an explanation of a set of facts or an explanation of a phenomenon. And so the theory of evolution explains the facts of evolution or all of this evidence that we see. So it's not really a theory in a sense of a guess. It's more a theory in a sense of a law or a sense of something that's been proven. And so here are some types of evidence of evolution. We've seen fossils. And so I showed you in class Archaeoteryx, right, showing uh, the evolution of birds from dinosaurs, and Tiktaalik, the evolution of land animals from fish. Here's Archaeoteryx. Uh, here's just an example of horse evolution over time. And here's our friend Tiktaalik from Neil Shubin. Okay, so we have fossils. We also have anatomy, so how um, organisms are constructed. So the prefix homo means the same. So homologous structures show common ancestry, and we use the example of these arms here. We have the radius, the ulna, uh, excuse me, the humerus, the radius, the ulna, uh, carpals and metacarpals in the arms. And so does the dog, the seal, the bat, the bird, and it shows that in some, uh, in the past, all these organisms shared a common ancestor. Now, the tricky thing for students is that could be a long time ago, right? The concept of geologic time is a lot longer than, say, the concept of when is the bell going to ring to end uh, C block. And then we have, I'm going to skip down to vestigial structures. Those are structures that show uh, something in the past, but they aren't used today. So the best example used in class was uh, whales and snakes having leg bones. They actually have leg bones towards uh, on their insides, but they obviously don't have legs that are left over. And a couple of you asked, well, wouldn't they be selected against? And that was a very good question. And the point would be if it's not really affecting their fitness level, then it might not be selected against and it can be left over as, as a vestigial structure. So let's review homologous, similar structures um, is showing common ancestry, vestigial showing uh, you know, evolution over time. And then analogous structures is an evidence for evolution, but it's, it's different than these two. What it means is that two organisms that aren't closely related, 
but that live in a similar environment may have evolved similar adaptations. So if you look at, a, say, whales and sharks, right? They have similar looking fins. Sometimes they're hard to tell apart, but whales breathe air and sharks don't. Um, whales are mammals, right? They're pretty different on a tree of life, but since they evolve uh, similar adaptations for a similar environment. And then here, um, there's some similarities between insect wings and bird wings. Um, so they're similar in, in function, but maybe a different structure. All right, so can you guess which type of evidence is this? Hopefully you got homologous structures. How about this one? Hopefully you got vestigial structures left over. How are homologous structures different than analogous structures? Can you answer that? See here, you have the analogous structures, right? The insect is not closely related to uh, the birds, but they're in a similar environment. So they might have similar adaptations. Here, these are showing common ancestry. <clears throat> analogous, not closely related, but similar environment leads to similar adaptations. Okay, we also talked a little bit about biochemistry. We looked at a table showing uh, similarities and differences in cytochrome C amino acids. We haven't gone over DNA and RNA yet in the course, but um, we'll learn how to read it and how it functions. And the more similar the DNA is, the more closely related the two species are. All right. And so in this one, you could say that um, the this is amino acids reveal evolution number of amino acids differences from humans so we are more closely related to chimpanzees and rhesus monkeys than to say a fruit fly um, this does not mean that we came from monkeys that is a misnomer um, it is not correct it just means that we shared a common ancestor and so here's what the common ancestor would look like right this would be a common ancestor of c and d here would be the common ancestor of A, B, C, and D, and this would be time, right? So this would be further back in geologic time. All right, we have embryology. So I'm um, seeing some conserved genes here for as organisms develop in utero. Uh, the more uh, similar looking the embryos, usually the um, more closely related they are in the tree of life. We didn't really get to go over biogeography as much. We just ran out of time. But um, we can see some species that were around before Pangaea broke up, before all the continents separated, and they'll be everywhere. Um, and then we'll see a good example would be islands, right? Like Darwin's finches, um, other organisms on islands. So we, we saw some over here, uh, the Wallace line and marsupials. But... <clears throat> The organisms on islands often look like and descended from organisms on the mainland. I mean, it's pretty interesting, like over here in Australia, it would be marsupials, whereas mammals rose to power in the rest of the world. Uh, what are some other pieces of evidence for evolution? We can see it directly happening, right? So think about how fast mosquitoes reproduce, and so we can see them um, surviving, and the ones that are resistant to this mosquito spray DTT live. And we saw it also with this uh, bacteria video. If you're watching this super early, we haven't seen this one yet, but it's the mega plate from Harvard where they put differing concentrations of antibiotics and you can see how the bacteria that could beat the antibiotic spread and went on. All right, what changes in a population occur because of evolution, right? So if we said evolution doesn't act on individuals, it acts on populations, but what happens due to it? And so we did a pogo on this. We looked at stabilizing selection, disruptive selection, and directional selection. I'd like you to be able to give an example of each of them. These are simplistic, but uh, but good. So here would be an example of this lizard. If you're too small, uh, you, maybe you can't get around fast enough or you get eaten. If you're in the middle, that's a good size to be. And if you're too big, maybe you're spotted too easily. So this would be going for a intermediate phenotype or right there in the middle. The classic example is human birth weight. You don't want a baby that's too small. The baby might have a, a lot of challenges. And if the baby's too big, that could be dangerous for the mother and child during childbirth. Here would be disruptive selection, choosing ex uh, two extreme phenotypes. So here with color of sand. So this uh, shell is light and this shell is dark blending in for different colored sand, but it's not good to be the light or the middle color. 
this has to be polygenic, right? This has to be on uh, traits that are controlled by many genes. Here's the anteater, right? The anteater with the longest trunk is able to get the most ants. So over time, it's selecting for a longer trunk. All right, can you come up with some examples? Here's uh, from Khan Academy. This is an example of beetle colors. So let's we'll see, I'm sorry. Stabilizing selection is best to be this color in the middle. Directional selection, best to be dark. Disruptive selection, best to be either light or dark. And so we can see these and remember that different modes of selection will happen as the environment changes. All right, how can evolution explain the unity and diversity of life? So what do we share in common with everything? Well, in common with everything, we got from the Luca. And the Luca was our friend that we talked about uh, just today in class. So we said we get the same genetic code, DNA or RNA. There's some debate as to which genetic code started life with, but regardless, it's ubiquitous today that organisms use DNA and RNA, uh, ubiquitous meaning everywhere, that organisms use ATP as a currency of energy, that organisms use proteins as enzymes. And, you know, the very first ones might have used RNA as enzymes, but then proteins overtook them. They have some type of lipid membrane to contain the cell. And they use cellular division as a means of reproduction. So we got this from the LUCA here. And from the LUCA, <clears throat> everything carries those uh, characteristics in common, but they also evolved more emergent properties and became multicellular. I mean, you can see the vast diversity of life on Earth and all of the beautiful uh, parts that came out of the tree of life. So what does it mean to be a species? A species is a group of organisms that can interbreed together and produce fertile offspring. <clears throat> so can two species occupy the same place? And the answer is no. If you remember the competitive exclusion principle, they'll compete for the exact same resources. So therefore, species become separate. And so this is what leads to that diversity of life. Here's the unity, the LUCA. And so over time, as uh, organisms evolve, trying to uh, fit into a certain niche in an environment, they can become different species. And we'll have to do that when we get back from winter break more, okay? And from that, we get different species that wouldn't be able to breed together. <clears throat> and here's some real life examples. So here, a barrier came out, this Grand Canyon, and now, we have two different types of species that won't breed together. All right, you made it. I hope that uh, this was uh, beneficial to you as you get ready for exam. Sunnier days are ahead, <laughs> right, for us. Um, don't forget to take care of yourself as you are studying and getting ready. Um, get sleep. Uh, remember to just try your best, and it's all we can ever ask of you. And the whole point of this exam is to help you consolidate your learning. It's not about a score. It's about your learning. Take care. Have a good one.